um, I wanted to say thank you for you guys being so generous with your time. And, um, you know, I'm so excited to reconnect. Um, and I wanted to tell everybody a little story about me meeting um, Kathy. And um, so I lived in Vermont for a long time. And um, I started practicing yoga around 2005. But then, you know, I tried different studios, different places. Um, there was one day when I was just kind of walking around Church Street and I stumbled upon that, you know, board on the sidewalk and the board said, Ashtanga Yoga. That's it. You just come with us. Come, come to practice with us. I'm like, okay, got to try something different. Never heard of Ashtanga. So, um, you know, after a winded staircase to the third floor, I finally arrived to the studio. It was so warm and so welcoming and everybody was smiling and happy to see me. And that's it. I made it my home. So nice. I'm, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was so worth I, climbing up all those stairs. <laughs> Well, I got used to it after a while. The first time I was like, where am I going? How far else am I going to go up? <laughs> but then, you know. Um, so, yeah. And Kathy was my first Ashtanga teacher. Um, I'm still on my journey through Ashtanga, obviously. We all are. And uh, I love this practice. And I think this is the purest practice of all, in my opinion. This is just my opinion. You may disagree. But I love to hear not just my breath, but I think the entire studio is breathing as we practice. It's the studio is alive and it's breathing. And I love it. And I don't need anything else. That's that's all that matters to me. <laughs> nice. Nice. So as I moved. Um, for different circumstances, I moved over to Tampa and uh, I was finding the yoga community here, trying to find Ashtanga uh, classes. And yeah, there, there are studios here, very good studios, uh, great teachers. And, um, you know, this time is really kind of uncertain for all of us. And I thought it would be a great idea just to connect. Um, people across the East Coast, at least for now, I don't know, maybe at some, at some point we'll go, you know, across the, uh, the universe, but right now it's East Coast. People I know, I'm trying to connect them on Zoom, and um, I created this podcast, and I invite a guest teacher every Saturday, and we chat, we, we practice together, and then I'll just post all of this on YouTube channel and let people choose their style, their teacher, enjoy um, practice. So I thought it would be a nice kind of community project. So my podcast is called Yoga Talk with Masha. My name is Masha. And um, yeah, welcome all. And today my guest is Kathy McNames. And Kathy, hi. <laughs> Thanks for having us all. Thanks Thank for having me. Thanks for having all of us. Yeah, no, it's so wonderful to reconnect. So I wanted to kind of ask a few questions and, um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you where you're from. I have a few people here who don't know you maybe, and uh, it would be great to hear your story. Um, I grew up in Mount Shasta, California, and I started practicing yoga with Lilius Folin on television when I was a kid. And she had a really long braid, and in the 70s, everyone wore a unitard or a, like a dance leotard with tights under them. And my mom would just say, oh, Kathy, the yoga's on. And I would run in and practice in front of the television. And I was just a kid, so I don't know if that counts. And then I started practicing yoga for college credit because I didn't play team sports. And I was afraid of most other 
uh, college physical education classes. So I took it through a community college in the summertime and transferred the credits to the university. And the class that I took then was really interesting. I haven't done anything like it since then. It was a little bit boring. I would show up fairly stoned. I don't know how I held it together because when class was over, I would laugh with my friend Tammy for like 30 minutes to an hour, just laughing once class ended. But it was in this cafeteria and it, went, it was in Chico, California where it's like super hot super hot and during the summer and um the cafeteria was not air conditioned but it was cool and we would all sit in an, a big oval there were like 60 people in this class it was run through the recreation department and the community college so there was a lot of people we would sit in a circle the teacher would sit in the middle and she would do something very, pretty gentle and then she would give an affirmation and all of us, all 60 of us, we would do things like, we did this twist where we would go like, we would go like this and we would look behind us and the whole class in unison would say, my past supports me, my past supports me, my past supports me. And then we would be very quiet while we got into the other side and then we would do that again. And we also did this one where we would rock our knee open and we had to look at our knee. And we would look at our knee and we would say, I love myself like a little baby. I love myself like a little baby. I love myself like a little baby. And it's super cool. I never taught that way because it just makes me laugh so much that I couldn't be serious about sharing it. But it is super cool. Anyway, we would do an hour and a half of affirmations. And well, there was probably 10 or 15 minutes in Shavasana at the end. And I don't know how. I remember we did camel. I don't remember the affirmation that goes with it. But um we did camel and also we did Baddha Konasana where, sorry about my dog, where we would do this and we would bounce our knees and we would say, I am as gentle as a butterfly. I am as gentle as a butterfly. I am as gentle as a butterfly. And uh, anyway, so that's how come we would laugh for so long once class was over. But it kind of got me hooked. So then I went to a really small yoga studio where we would do 45 minutes of pranayama and 45 minutes of asana. And I think it cost like $50 a month or something. And I thought, I was a college student. I was like, I don't know if I can afford this, but I really, I really wanted to go. I finally, I went for, you know, this really huge long amount of time. It felt like I went for like two months and then I got invited to the advanced class where I thought I was actually going to learn more fun asanas, more fun postures. And instead, the holds in the pranayama just got longer. And I was like, I should be careful what I ask for, because I really wanted to go to the advanced class. And the first five minutes I was in there, I was like, I do not want to be here. Anyway, and then I moved to Vermont in 1988, and I looked everywhere for yoga and i had to practice on my own that's when i started kind of studying dharma mitra's poster and i thought he was like you know a movie star i would never meet him a, few, a number of years later i hosted him here in vermont and um so that was cool but anyway so then i was here in 88 i had to practice by myself for a little while then i found an iyengar teacher out in jericho penny holden who has since passed away and i did 2 hours 2 hour iyengar classes once or twice a week and they were always painfully boring but i would learn quite a bit every single time i went so I was, I felt like I was disciplined because the pace was so slow. So anyway, Penny Holden is the first person. In 1988, I read an article on Ashtanga 
And I even wrote the author and asked for more information because I really, I wanted to decipher what it said, but I couldn't figure it out. Like trying to learn Ashtanga off of a three or four page article is impossible. And it covered both primary and second, just a list of names. And I remember thinking, I wanna do this, but I couldn't figure it out. So anyway, then I went to this Iyengar teacher, Penny Holden, and she said that I was, I would be a better fit for Ashtanga yoga. And I was like, oh, I don't know what that is. So then she turned me on to Beryl and I started studying with Beryl and then Beryl's book came out. And then Ashtanga blew up after Beryl's book came out and her book was published in, I think, 95. Wow. How's that? That's how you found Ashtanga, right? That's how I found Ashtanga. Okay. And then I well, studied with Beryl and Tom, and then I studied with David Swinson, and then I met, you know, David Williams and Manju, and we were hosting people. And in 1998, um, Yoga Vermont opened up, and there weren't very many yoga studios at that time. So we ended up hosting all kinds of famous people. Also, I started just before Ashtanga blew up. So, so a lot of these people are kind of my family friends, you know, um, which I feel really lucky to have gotten in before it got completely flooded. Um, so if they're my family friends, they're also your family friends. And, and then just practice and have fun and meet people and it's, I prefer to hang out with people if we have something to do and Ashtanga is probably my favorite thing to do. <laughs> that is, I can't agree with that for sure. <laughs> yeah. What is, um, what is important about Ashtanga? What is Ashtanga? I know because we have a few people here who may not be familiar with the style. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah. So Ashtanga yoga is named after a philosophy. And there's also other lineage that have named their yoga Ashtanga yoga. The philosophy is covered in the yoga sutras. And uh, Baba Hari Das named his type of yoga Ashtanga yoga. And then the lineage that my information comes through is through Patabi Joyce and Krishnamacharya. And um, that Ashtanga yoga is a very physical practice. It was named after the philosophy so that people wouldn't forget about the philosophy and that people would incorporate the philosophy into their lives. I think that at one point, Patabi Joyce was concerned that if people became incredibly powerful, like strong, flexible, healthy, clear-minded, um, glowing, all of the benefits that Ashtanga Yoga creates, if people became that, they could also become very egotistical. So he named it after the philosophy to remind people to be humble. Um, and what is it? It's, uh, there's pranayama and asana and bandha all happening at the same time. And it's laid out. So there's a warm up, and then there's more warm up, and then there's a series of postures, um, first series or primary series, or yoga chikitsa is designed to make yourself really strong for you, what you've inherited, whether it's long connective tissue, short connective tissue, twisted skeleton, very straight skeleton, whatever you've got, you become very physically balanced. And then second series or Nadi Shodhana or intermediate series, all of the first two have three names apiece. That's designed to open up the energetic system and uh, create more flow of prana. And the stamina that is built up, I, I, when people ask me about Ashtanga, a lot of times I equate it to going out running. You know, so if you want, if you prefer to, go on a nice slow casual walk you probably want to do restorative yoga or maybe yin yoga maybe 
Um, and if you like to do a nice brisk walk, you might want to do Iyengar yoga. If you're dealing with a lot of injuries and that sort of thing, all of the yoga is helpful if you take it at your own pace. And then if you like to go out and run, you know, four miles or whatever, six miles, that's kind of what Ashtanga is. It's um, really high power. Um, and it isn't because you can do it in a relaxed manner, but there's this strength in it from having the bandhas on the whole practice. So anyway, I kind of equate it to running. It's not, but it does build a, a lot of really nice stamina and it also increases your oxygen uptake in your, in your lungs. Yeah, it's very physical. Ashtanga is very physical practice, but you can also do it, you know, the way you feel like, you know, what, whatever is available, yeah. whatever is accessible. And also it's a set sequence. So if I'm on an airplane and I'm kind of going a little bit nuts and I don't feel like reading, I might just go through the series in my head. So every inhale and every exhale is choreographed. Like it is a set sequence and it's a lot to memorize. It's quite a bit to do. And it's, in, it's very enjoyable. I love it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing this. This is wonderful. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. So what do you think every, well, in your opinion, um, what does every yoga practitioner need to know? I would say don't let anyone boss you around. That's the main thing. Always be in charge of yourself. Always be responsible for yourself. And yes, it's good to gain information and gain technique and gain knowledge and maybe put it all together and be able to, you know, do a 10 minute practice or hold one posture for 10, like whatever, whatever kind of the goal is of what you're learning, it's okay to kind of go after it and get the knowledge. But the second that you have a thought, like, I don't know if I should do this, don't do it. Or if you think, I kind of feel held back in this, like behave when you're around the teacher, but go for it when you're by yourself. Like you are in charge of yourself. Don't let anyone boss you around. Don't let anyone push you to the point where you get injured or push you to the point where you break down emotionally or, you know, like you should always be comfortable. You should feel strong and comfortable. You should come away from your yoga practice feeling better and better is different. Like sometimes I'm like, oh, I feel so light. And other times I'm like, oh, I feel so relaxed or anyway, I usually come out of my practice. Well, I would say 100% of the time I come out of my practice feeling better. So the first thing I would say to people who are practicing is don't let people boss you around. Even if someone's being very demanding of you, just don't let it happen. And then a follow up to that is figure out what you know so that you're not constantly reliant on a teacher. Do you know the bandhas? Do you know your pranayama? Do you know your asanas? What are your questions? Ask your questions, get it figured out. And, and like the yoga, your own yoga is for yourself. And then probably the third thing I would say is not just listen to your intuition, but really listen to your body and your breath. Listening to your pranayama and feeling your body. If you, there's some postures where I'm like, this is my experience. I'm getting into the posture. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Ooh, it's getting intense. If I just get past this intense part, I'm gonna be in the posture. Okay, I'm in the posture, I'm good again. But I went through that like little no trespassing zone and my personality is like definitely go through the no trespassing zone. But when I go through the no trespassing zone, I'm actually releasing chemicals in my body that are counterproductive to what I'm doing. 
So I want to flood my system with really nice hormones, not the type of hormones that are trying to protect me from an injury. Because as soon as pain is activated, or as soon as we start to protect ourselves, there's a little bit of a chemical release that causes us to self-cast, which means it's actually releasing hormones that make us stiffer. And it might just be a drop, but, and I'm not successful at this. I'm just telling you kind of what I'm working on. What I'm working on is don't go through the no trespassing zone. Go up to the edge of the no trespassing zone, keep it comfortable, keep it healthy, stay there, be okay with it, get out, do it again next time. That's probably more of a dream than actual advice, but I think it's, I think that's good. I think all of us have this moment where, well, it, I, and I think it's, a, you know, just a society we live in and grew up with, um, you know, that teaches us that just push through, just go through it, you know, you, you get over your pain, keep going. And I think we all have those moments. I mean, a lot of us are athletes or ex-athletes uh, with tons of injuries because we keep pushing ourselves through. And I don't know about people growing up right now, but I know that when I was growing up, it was like, no pain, no gain. And that might be true for like building muscle and weightlifting. You need to feel, you know, you need to feel the intensity, but I don't necessarily think that's true for every single physical activity. Yeah, that is amazing. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, I have one more question for you. Um, because we have a few teachers, yoga teachers here in this podcast, um, I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, what is one thing that every yoga teacher needs to know? So the definition of yoga, yoga is defined in the yoga sutras as yoga is the cessation of fluctuations of the mind. Yoga, chitta, vritti, narodaha. Yoga, chitta, vritti, narodaha. Yoga, chitta is stuff. Vritti is swirling. Narodaha is no, 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 not that. Chitta is the stuff of the mind. Vritti is the same thing as like rotated triangle, right? Vritti is in that word. Um, so swirling, churling, whirling, churning, sloshing, and it, it, yoga is when the mind is still or calm, at least calm or hopefully focused and perhaps blank. And I think I've already talked this much, so I've already broken this entirely. But I think that yoga teachers are supposed to not stimulate thought. We're not there to stimulate thought. So as soon as someone, it's been interesting working on Zoom where it's kind of me doing a monologue while I'm teaching, because when we're in the studio together, I can really hear whether people know what's going on or not. So sometimes we get together and we just practice because we all know the practice. Or if I see that someone is lagging behind, then I'll start to, this is serious air quotes, teach. Um, but to not stimulate thought, just the less information, the less, the less you, you're putting out, the better. So it's that balance between like giving the information out, right? And then also not giving it 28 times to the same person who's like, I've heard that, I've heard that, I've heard that. Like just anyway, not stimulating thought. Wow, this is powerful. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. What are we gonna learn today? I know you you were planning on doing something. I thought that we would work on some pranayama. Yeah. And in the middle of, we did um, primary series at nine o'clock this morning. And then we took a little break and then we got on to talk with you. And 
in the middle of my practice, I remembered a pranayama that I haven't practiced for a long time. So I thought we would do that one. It's, um, it's from Krishnamacharya and he would do it, he would do it for a half an hour a day. So 15 minutes on each side. We won't do it for that long. Um, and this particular pranayama, you want to sit down. It doesn't matter which leg you start with. So you want to be in Jana Shasasana A. And if you feel like you love Janu Shasasana B, you can do it in Janu Shasasana B. So Janu Shasasana A, your foot is in against your thigh. Janu Shasasana B, you're sitting up on your heel. So either way, A or B. And then you kind of line your body up over your foot and you're gonna be in for a while. So you don't have to hold your hand up you can hang on to your foot and let your elbows touch the floor, whatever is the most comfortable. Mula Bandha is root lock. It's like a Kegel that you hold the whole time. Mula Bandha, Uddiyana Bandha, and Jalandhara Bandha will all be on. Root lock, flying upward lock, and chin lock. So it's an inhale arch. Exhale down. Hold your exhale out. Inhale, arch. Exhale, down. Hold your exhale out. Let Uddiyana Bandha really scoop up. Inhale, arch. Exhale out, lower. Uddiyana Bandha scoops up. Inhale, arch. And release. We'll ease into it. We'll do those three breaths and then we'll switch sides. We'll do three breaths on this side and then we'll go back to the first side. I'll clarify a couple of things. Another thing I do, Masha, when I'm leading is I often work, we will do it and then we'll talk about it. I just kind of, I kind of like it that way. So hang on to your foot, inhale, arch, exhale, all three bandhas, hold your exhale out. Inhale, arch. Exhale, hold empty. Inhale, arch. Exhale, hold empty. Inhale, arch. Exhale, release. So root lock, mula bandha, is a kegel at the base of the spine, and that will be on. And then uddiyana bandha, when we're practicing the flow of primary series or second series, it's on about this much. When the exhale is completely empty, Uddiyana Bandha comes on this much. So that's what I'm doing. And to do, to have Uddiyana Bandha sucked up like that, um, to get it sucked up as much as possible, you also tuck your chin, which is called Jalandhara Bandha. So that's the three Bandhas. 
it will feel like when you're doing this pranayama, it will feel like you're going to be adjusting your spine from the inside of your body. Does anyone have any questions about all, any three of those bandhas? Oh, Masha's coming up. This is Gina, I have a question. Um, yeah. uh, so when I was exhaling, I think I was doing the opposite. I'm, I'm just becoming familiar with the bandhas. Yeah. Um, I read recently that they're, they are really the key to stability and, and, and going stably through the pose. Um, so what advice do you have for, for that counterintuitiveness? Because like when I exhale, I want to release, but, it, but it's really drawing up more, I think. Yeah, it yeah, it does draw up more. It's almost like um a vacuum packing machine. When you vacuum pack your body, it automatically sucks up there. And if Uriana Banda is sucking up, Mula Banda's on. I hate to tell you this because it's so encouraging to not not work too hard on Mula Banda. I like Mula Banda on between thirty and sixty percent power. Any isometric, if it's on 100%, I'm only going to be great for about three minutes and then my body's like, I'm done. Um, but there are people who actually think that if you just touch your tongue behind the front teeth, that just lifting your tongue up and making that contact point lifts Mula Bandha. I don't feel that. And I want more strength than that. So I'm really pulling Uddiyana, or I'm not pulling it. I'm really letting Uddiyana Bunda suck up on that exhale. Yeah. So it's a sucking up rather than an ascension. It's a, like, because there's the sinking and deep and or descending that I heard are two different things. And then there's this ascending, but I think it's different than ascension. It's more active. Yeah. So when I'm doing this and I'm holding my exhale out, I have Uddiyana Bunda on 100%. And that's how come, here is, here's nothing. Here's like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. At about 50, now I'm gonna have to change what I'm doing. So here comes my exhale. Here's my sucking up. Okay. Thank you. It's going to take some practice. I really appreciate yeah, that. But that that's advice. it. That's it. I saw, I saw the, yeah. it was good. Yeah, you got it. All and right. It, and it is intense. The other thing that happens when you're doing this particular um, hold, this, it's called Richaka Kumbhaka. Richaka means exhale, Kumbhaka means hold. When you're doing this hold, um, It's, it's going to feel like suction. You're going to have to tuck your chin. And it's the suction that if you, if you at all feel your spine, you'll feel your spine kind of self-aligning from the suction. Yes. All right. Cool. Thank cool. you so much. That's yeah, going to be a game changer. Awesome. Does anyone else have any questions before we do it a few more times? Okay. So I'm going to show you, you can do A or B. So either your foot is in against your leg or you're sitting on your heel. And if you wanted to, you can keep your hands up or you can keep your hands, you know, elbows on the floor or whatever. And the first part starts out like this. You inhale and arch and then exhale down and hold. The second part, once you've done a few breaths that way, then it looks like this. This is my exhale hold. I won't hold it that long. I'll just show you. And then it's only my head coming up like this to inhale. And then I'm right back in it to the exhale hold. So if for your spine and your sacrum, you need to arch, you can arch all the way up. But if you're cruising and comfortable on that exhale hold, then you just lift your head a little bit, get your inhale and go right back in. So this time we'll do four breaths in a row. When you're ready, inhale, arch. Exhale, down, hold empty.
Inhale, lift your head. Exhale, hold empty. Inhale, lift your head. Exhale, hold empty. Inhale, lift your head. Exhale, hold empty. Inhale, arch. Exhale, release. We'll switch sides. So Krishnamacharya, he would work up to 15 minutes on one side with no set number of breaths. So he would just exhale and stay in for as long as he was comfortable. And when he needed to, he would lift his head and inhale and then go right back in. So right now I'm doing it to a count and I'm trying to make sure that we all survive and I'm trying to make sure that my bandhas are really strong. But if I were doing it in a uh, longer format, it would just be breathing on your own. So when you're ready, inhale, arch. Exhale down. Forehead tucks, bandhas on. Hold your exhale out. Inhale, lift your head. Exhale, hold empty. Inhale, lift your head. Exhale, hold empty. Inhale, lift your head. One more. Inhale, arch. Exhale, release. So on the first side, we did a set of four. On the second side, we did a set of four. Um, another thing about practicing this on your own, sometimes it's easier to set a timer and just say, I'm going to do five minutes on my right leg and five minutes on my left leg and not worry about how many breaths it is. Or if you're going to count your breaths, have like <laughs> acorns or something where you can move it because as your mind empties, you won't be able to count. Which is how come I did not count all five sun citation B this morning in practice. I didn't have any acorns. Um, hey, Kathy, I have a question. Yeah. Hi. Um, <laughs> this the, is my friend, Carolyn. Go ahead. Hi, Masha. Nice to meet you. I'm curious because I've never tried, well, this is the most uh, consistent 
pranayama practice I've had with you doing it twice a week, but I've never tried pranayama like in a forward fold. And I'm finding like doing that for the first time, I could really feel when you're trying to engage your bandhas, you can really feel your back, your spine, like you're saying, like stri straighten out. And it was quite difficult. It almost made me get mula bandha way more than sitting up straight. So I don't know if Krishmacharya ever explained or like why Janusha Shasana or doing this kind of pranayama forward, folding forward, but if you know if it, if or why, and it helps. I don't know if, I don't know why, a lot of the, the opinions on what things help are based on old information. And sometimes that old information is golden. And sometimes that old information is like, whatever. Whenever I find, there's a whole list. Okay, Krishnamacharya has the Yoga Makaranda first part and then the Yoga Makaranda second part. The second part is based on problems. And I'm not into problems. I've really been focused on positive speech, keeping my personality. Like, I don't want to erase my personality, but I do want to have more positive speech. So the the second part of the Yoga Makaranda, where it's kind of allo allopathic, where it's like, oh, if you have asthma, these are the postures you should do. This is the pranayama you should do. Um, some of it makes perfect sense. And other times it's like, I have no idea why you would think this. I think he's a genius. I think energetically he had um, a lot of knowledge considering the time that we're living in. What I, what I do know about this pranayama is that he really liked Janushasana B. It's an asana and a mudra. And he did this pranayama for an hour a day, a half an hour on one side, a half an hour on another side, a kick, like often. And he did it a lot, a half an hour, so 15 minutes on each side. So what we feel in our sacrum and in our spine and for me in the alignment of the bones in my leg, um, he must have been all about that because he was all about it when he had a physical body. I don't know why, I don't know how, I don't know what, but I know that he practiced this quite a bit and late into his life. Yeah, because there's something that it's doing differently than sitting up in Lotus, yeah. especially in the sacrum and that area, like yeah. it's really doing something different. And for me, I have instability, like one side of my back is much tighter. I think it has to do in my sacrum. So like Janu Shashasana with the right knee bent was a lot harder and I could feel trying to breathe into that area exactly and where the restriction is. And also there are two schools of thought on tight areas of the body. One school of thought is you do your tight side first in each posture. This is not Ashtanga. This is Ashtanga plus. This is like not really Ashtanga information. You do the tight side of your body first, and then you do the looser side exactly how you did the tighter side. So the tighter side is leading in every asana. That is not how I practice, but that is recommended in Iyengar yoga. So, yeah. I could try that. <laughs> for, for this type of pranayama and this type of practice, it would, it would work. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else, any questions or answers? All right. Um, we're not gonna do that for 15 minutes on each side. Oh, you know what else? The nadis in the body, the energetic channels, if they have a loop in them or a knot, it's called a granti. And this is just trivia, but I don't know what Krishnamacharya thought about the grantis. I know that you need to do asana and bandhas in order to be able to handle pranayama. You can always do pranayama. It, I don't think it's going to make any of us go crazy. But if you want to do pranayama in a really powerful way, then you have to have your body and your energetic body ready for it. 
So asana and bandha make your body ready for pranayama. And then the pranayama is supposed to loosen these knots in the energetic channels. And Katabi Joyce said, there are only six grantis in the body and they're all in your sacrum. And his teacher was Krishnamacharya and Krishnamacharya was doing this pranayama a lot. So I kind of feel like the how, the what, the why, um, I just feel lucky that I even know Krishnamacharya did this as much as he did. You know, so then I can take it because I'm alive. I can take it and do my own experiment. That's what he was doing when he was alive. You know, I also feel like whoever's alive, it's up to us to create the yoga. Like the traditional information is crucial, but how, it, how it's presented and how we handle it is up to the people who have bodies not up to the people who are quoted in books who are no longer in their bodies or they're in a new body anyway this is just making me think but maybe the grunties you can feel those grunties when you're in johnny shoshasana like i could definitely feel that yeah rather than sitting up that's how come i mentioned it yeah yeah <laughs> i think so too cool um, all right. Does anyone else have any other questions right now? Okay. Um, I would like to do Bastrika and I'm just going to compare it to Kapalabhati. Kapalabhati is like, if you were a fighter and you were doing that little handbag thing, which I never did, but my uncles did, they wouldn't hit it and leave their arm out there and hit it and leave their arm out there. It's almost like there was as much power getting their hand back for the next punch as there was power in the punch. So your diaphragm is going to be punching. Kapalabhati, the inhale is passive. So a lot of times it's hard on uh, these computers to hear the breath, so I'm going to get a little closer. So here's Kapalabhati. I'll do it right into the microphone. And nice, Isaac. And you, you can't really hear the inhale. And then here's Bastrika. It sounds like you're sawing a crosscut saw with someone. And if you've ever used a crosscut saw, you don't actually push. You pull, and then the other person pulls, and then you pull, and the other person pulls. So it sounds like the exhale is the most important part. Nice, Isaac. But really, the inhale is your responsibility, just like pulling the saw is your responsibility. Okay, so anyway, sorry for all the metaphors. So here's Bastrika. That's amazing. Okay, does anyone have any questions about either of these? I discovered something recently that as a kid, when you would mimic, when I would mimic the sound of a dog panting, that it was more equal in and out, in and out. And so somehow I drew a parallel between this sound and that um, Bastrika. Yeah. Yes, and also Bastrika is a fast ujjayi. If you practice ujjayi pranayama, Bastrika will seem a little bit less crazy. Kathy, right. this isn't a, a very beginner question about ujjayi breath, but are, are you always supposed to have your, like, is the idea that the air is, is sucking in and out and your your belly is not expanding and coming back in it's always in like your ribs are expanding correct from okay. your belly button down to your tailbone is perfectly still and strong 
And then your rib cage is doing the bellows, whether it's slow for Ujjayi or whether it's faster for Bastrika. And okay. your ribs are in these little sockets where they kind of float. So they can, it takes a lot of opening up of all of the intercostals, intercostal muscles, you know, to free up each rib, but you can get your whole rib cage to be able to move. So I hold a lot of times my hands in just like I have ovaries. So right around my ovaries and I try to keep that part still. It also helps if you tuck your chin a little bit. So um, we'll do Bastrika. You're gonna inhale and then begin. Exhale completely, inhale, hold. Bundas are on. And exhale. Another thing, Masha, that I do is I tend when I'm around people to keep going and the meditation happens despite me and the meditation happens the more familiar people get with whatever we're working on so really after you do bastrika you might want to sit for the same amount of time or the same amount of breaths which of course if you're seated that's going to take a lot more time because then you're just breathing passively automatically anyway but i do think i do think that meditation is a private uh a private event kind of yeah definitely not a group event <laughs> i mean I, I agree with you yeah. i wanted to ask you about kapalabhati so um my question stands from the fact that i'm teaching various styles now and one of the styles is Bikram yoga, but it's not really Bikram Bikram. So it's kind it's of evolved. that tradition. Yeah. Yeah, it's evolving now into different, something different. Uh, but, you know, Kapalabhati is still part of the practice and part of the sequence. And at the end, we're doing Kapalabhati. And it's that style when you exhale through your mouth. Um, I don't even think that's Kapalabhati. You know what? I, think, I actually, I actually think that Bikram yoga is has become very specific. Bikram yoga is very, very good at healing knee injuries, and it's very, very good at motivating people who are motivated by someone jumping their shit. Which that does not motivate me. As soon as someone starts snapping their fingers and pointing at me and clapping their hands, I'm like, I'm out of here. I'm not going to play that way. So, you know, so Bikram is kind of like the first boot camp. But Kapalabhati, in the traditions that I follow, is in and out of the nose. Yeah. And it can be as light as a bunny's breath, or it can be a little bit more fierce. And, and that's why, you know, uh, what I wanted to ask, because, you know, now kind of the evolution of this, I won't even call it Bikram anymore. It's called 26-2. Right. Um, so it's just postures of based on Bikram, but everything, the style of teaching is completely different. And even the breath at the end of Pranayama is completely different. So... I'm trying to teach more of a traditional Kapala body now without spitting everything out of your mouth. <laughs> right, right. You don't even want to be doing this during COVID. Oh. Even if you're outside, you don't want people exhaling through their mouth. So I don't know, Masha, if you remember this chart, but if you inhale and exhale through your nose, 
Bastrika, Kapalabhati, Ujjayi, Nadi Shodhana usually. Um, it's a hot breath. It, it's a heated breath. If you inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth, it's a warm breath. If you inhale through your mouth and exhale through your nose, it's a tepid breath. And if you inhale and exhale through your mouth, it's a, cool, a cold breath or a cooling breath. So I feel like I don't get involved in other people's pranayama that much because people are like, you know, oh, inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth, that's so cooling. And I'm like, that's not really cooling. Satali is cooling. You know, anyway, I don't know that much about Bikram. I don't know that much about all of that, except I know that I hardly ever agree with it. <laughs> I can hear you. I, I but just like you said, I found a lot of benefits of hot styles of yoga, um, you know, and some of the postures, you know, th there's a lot a lot of therapeutic value in some of the postures. You yeah. know, others not so much. I may not understand all of it, but you know, I process it through my own eyes and my own body, how my body feels. It's the same That's thing with Ashtanga practice. You know, some postures are absolutely beneficial for my body. Others are like, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah I think we all find that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Kathy, why don't we practice Kabbalah Bhati in our pranayama, pranayama? In the long form pranayama? Yeah. Because someone else made that up and it wasn't handed down that way. It's like, why don't we do Hanumanasana in primary series or intermediate series? Or why don't we do um three-legged down dog ever in ashtanga because it does feel good right it's just not in like it's okay. a classical it's a classical sequence that's been handed to me that i learned and that's all that's in it so when i'm practicing it i only do it anyway so the real answer is i have no idea <laughs> and other people who have an idea are probably incorrect. But if someone knows the answer to that, I would be interested. But I think anyone who knows the answer to that is already dead. <laughs> oh, well. Here we are, left with all the mysteries. Masha, thank you for having us all. And Gina, it was so nice to meet you. Oh, it was great meeting you too. I learned so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, of course. Of Thank course. You, Kathy. And Masha, we'll put this link up wherever we put up yeah. all the links. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I love you, Kathy. And I was I love so you too. Happy. Thanks for making this happen. Thanks for the little interview. I love you all. Thank you for Namaste. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Emelina. Thank you. Jean.